Uh, so we had a great uh, first kickoff with uh, Eric Green giving us this pretty general overview of, of uh, both from genomics to digital uh, health and medicine. And uh, now we'll follow that up, I think, with an equally impactful uh, talk from uh, George Church. And since most of us know well uh, George's work, I thought great to have uh, somebody more personally connected uh, give the intro for George. So Jason Bo will. Thanks, and I should say there are three or two prime seats for people in the back. This would be a good time to come up and grab, grab a couple seats if you want them. Uh, I'm Jason Bob, and I'm the director of the Sharing Lab here at the Icon Institute. And uh, thanks to Eric and Pamela and Judy and Orly uh, for putting this together. Uh, I've known George and worked with George uh, for the past 10 years. And when I was asked to do a one-minute introduction of George, I felt like it was a bit like being asked to write a summary of Wikipedia in 140 characters. So it was a big challenge. Um, and George um, really uh, has had many professional uh, faces. Um, and his list of achievements so far in his career are extraordinary. And it's really no coincidence that he was awarded several years ago the Bauer Prize, which is the longest running technology prize in the United States. And it's an award that's shared by Thomas Edison, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, and many other legends in technology, science, and medicine. Um, for people who are really familiar with genomics, you may know George the best from the perspective of the Personal Genome Project, which he founded uh, 10 years ago in 2005. And there are now uh, sites in four countries going on a dozen more. And this effort uh, was really has been pioneering uh, for the field of personal genomics uh, in regards to rep uh, reciprocity, data sharing, the concept of open consent, and uh, pioneering participatory research where participants are co-investigators in the research study. And this uh, effort has really made a lasting impression on many people around the world, not the least of which are the thousands of participants who are signed up for one of these many PGP sites around the world. Um, Let's see here. So what you may not know is that George also has made incredible contributions in reading genomes, or his contributions in reading genomes is really just a small part of a larger set of projects, which includes uh, writing genomes and the field of synthetic biology. And so many of the extraordinary projects, which I encourage you to look up and read his book, Regenesis, Mage, Gene Drives, Mirror World through Recoli, Polonies, and he was uh, formative, uh, made a formative effort in the, getting the brain initiative going, DNA origami nanorobots, uh, and many, many more. Um, and his book, also something very special about it, is that he encoded all 350 pages of his book in DNA. Um, and so it's one of the most, the single most uh, printed book in the world. There are over 70 billion copies, uh, which of course fit on the head of a pin uh, as DNA. And he has uh, really, his work uh, and editing, he's made seminal contributions to the CRISPR technology, which many people are excited about, of course. And in his spare time, uh, he's also bringing back cold tolerant elephants. Uh, you might know them as woolly mammoths. And so his contributions uh, really as one of the greatest living technologists of our era, he's also a very successful entrepreneur. And so you might see his technologies and products and many of the companies uh, such as these and his uh, con conflict of interest slide is uh, legendary. So please help me with a warm welcome of George Church. There's the conflict of interest slide that Jason was talking about. Uh, and I do have, uh, I will say nice things about some of these organizations that helped us get our technologies from the ivory tower into the marketplace. Uh, where it could be of use. Um, now I'm, I, I, I could frame, the, sometimes I frame this talk as a collection of technologies that might be useful to people in the room. This one will be framed sort of as an argument of why big data is easier than little data. And it's not a topic that I talk about all the time, but, uh, but why not? Um, and so some of you might say, uh, yeah, it's better than little data, but now, uh, in fact, there was a while where people weren't even sure it was better, um, but is it really easier? Why would we say it's easier? Uh, this is uh, 
one of your typical data warehouses that I visited in England, um, and they have uh, you know 250 uh, kilowatts uh, per computer unit, and uh, all those red pipes are uh, so that you can douse the whole thing with uh, heptafluoropropane uh, in case there's a problem uh, and you don't really want to be in there when all the heptafluoropropane goes down to put out the fire. Um, and you have to wear these, uh, these ear uh, protection uh, because of the noise in there. And it was, uh, so anyway, this, this, is, uh, this is what big data is associated with in our mind. But I'm going to... I'm going to say that it is easier, and, and I'm going to give a few anecdotes that are connected, uh, starting with a very early one where um, we, didn't really, really, we didn't really know uh, uh, how we would go about understanding RNA, and then it will end with uh, how we uh, look at DNA, RNA, and protein in a similar sort of way. How, how, what is the advantage of going to three dimensions? and getting uh, really big data sets about uh, cells, tissues, organs, human beings, and their environment. And, and then, then these other topics will, along the way. We'll keep see, you'll keep seeing the slide, uh, so you'll know where you are. Uh, you can know when to leave. Um, so this is, uh, this is uh, me in 1973. Um, just c couldn't quite grow my beard yet, uh, teenager. Uh, you know, doing what most teenagers do, solving crystal structures of folded nucleic acids. And, uh, and, uh, and here is the status sort of in, in the early 70s of what people thought transfer RNA would look like. And needless to say, they were, they were all wrong. They were based on chemical reactivity and things like that. And, uh, and what we did instead is we collected uh, 8,000 plus uh, diffraction data points. <laughs> to cover 1,652 non-hydrogen uh, atoms. And that turned out to be a much richer, much more informative, and most importantly, correct structure, and it's, and it's still in use uh, to this day. Now, there's a similar kind of uh, anxiety that, that uh, went around starting at the beginning of the Genome Project, which, was, which will be the topic here of how would we go about comparing genomes and, and what were the shortcuts that we could use to bring the price down from what we worried would be, you know, three to thirty billion dollars down to something reasonable. And this was, uh, uh, the project kind of started in a little meeting I was at in 1984 with the Department of Energy, and then, 80, and then started for real in 1990 with the NIH, and in between was this National Academy of Sciences study where they invite a bunch of people to give their opinion. And I was uh, in the room when uh, one of the computer scientists, who will remain nameless, calculated, th did this calculation where you'd compare the human genome to itself or some large number of genomes to themselves. So 3 billion squared would be around 10 to the, 10 to the 19th uh, operations of some sort you would need to compare. And so this would be on the order of 300,000 CPU years, and hence 99 percent of the genome uh, budget should go to him and his computer science colleagues. Uh, this was not at all a self-serving, uh, I mean, I think I actually believe this, and it ignored the fact that there were already in the computer science literature linear algorithms for doing these searches, um, and some of them even better than linear, and, and, and hence we have BLAST and Google and, and lots of other things that do things like this all the time for much less. And so we ended up spending a tiny fraction of the genome budget on, on sequence, on, on, sorry, on computing. But nevertheless, it was a fairly big project at the time, uh, you know, and it, and, uh, and it was, and these were the sequence shortcuts that were suggested over and over again. And I'm giving this kind of as a, as a, a warm-up uh, uh, analysis of why smart people don't always do really super smart things. And so one of the things that just every lab seemed to pass through a phase where their goal was to get 1x coverage. And for those of you who know the jargon here, that means covering every base pair exactly once so that you wouldn't be any waste where you'd sequence them two or three times. I mean, that's just, it was just too painful to even imagine sequencing the genome uh, more than once. Uh, and so now, for those of you that are smiling, uh, you know, it's pretty routine to do 30 or 50x coverage of human genomes. And some of our bacterial genomes, we do at 1,000x coverage just for kicks. Uh, and it's just, it's just laughable. Uh, 
And then they would focus on the protein coding. It was all, the project was almost canceled because they, when people realized there were 99% of the genome didn't code for proteins, um, and then they thought of various clever ways of doing this. The, the, the least clever part of it is we still haven't actually figured out all the proteins, even though we've pretty much sequenced uh, 100,000 human genomes. Uh, we're still, if we were done it this way, we'd still be doing it. And then focusing on single nucleotide polymorphisms, I think it had its advantages and disadvantages. So this is what I think uh, people didn't really fully anticipate, uh, and I think they can be excused for not anticipating it. So we were on a nice Moore's Law curve, which is actually breathtaking, uh, both for, comp you know, the computing uh, world, the, the green Moore's Law, and, and also for sequencing, going back to the dawn of DNA sequencing in the 60s. We were on this nice curve, and, and in the computer science community, they're, they're or sorry, the computer engineering community, they're much more disciplined, and they stick, stuck to this law, uh, but we didn't. We were just kind of like fell off this cliff in 2005 for reasons that, that uh, we'll, we'll probably skip over today. But the point is it has to keep going, and I don't really think it's plateauing. I think it's, 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 it's still going faster than Moore's Law, and you'll see some of the reasons is that we're going to this uh, uh, three-dimensional and subcellular resolution, and there's a lot of uh, uh, information there that uh, we need to get. And so t instead of taking six decades, as you would have predicted from the very aggressive exponential Moore's Law, it took about six years. But it wasn't just about cost. Uh, you wouldn't want to have a really cheap uh, genome, which is 75 percent error rate. Um, which you can get for free, actually. Uh, but we were debating at the beginning of the Genome Project whether 10 to the minus 2 or 10 to the minus 3 was the right number for the error rate, which I, I felt at the time and I still feel would have been an appalling way to achieve the goal and probably would have taken us longer if we had, if we had set that as the goal. Anyway, uh, now we're uh, published, uh, there are publications that have 10 to the minus 7, including one that we co-authored with uh, CGI in um, 2012. And the un unpublished data they're getting for the well-behaved parts of the genome is around one in a billion error rate. There still are not so well-behaved parts of the genome, um, but even these uh, are reflected in this, this second plot, which is the haplotype phase length. In other words, the, the alter alterations, the variations that occur in your maternal and paternal chromosome. And these went from sort of, in 2007, the first diploid genome, which was done on ABI capillary electrophoresis, was around 300,000, and now it's getting up into the multi-million base pairs. But we really want it telomere to telomere, and then we'll come back to the very end how we might do that. Now, something that we keep hoping, every time we get a monopoly for a brief period of time, like ABI for, was for a while, and Illumina is right now partially shared with complete genomics, but it's basically a monopoly. We keep hoping that there will be another one, and there have been quite a few monopoly breakers. Illumina basically broke 454's monopoly. Uh, and this is the one that, that, that Hope Springs Eternal for. This is the oldest and slowest technology developed, uh, so I, I'm not, like, giving these guys a, a break. Uh, and, and I was involved in it in the late 80s <coughs> and, and, and still. And, but it is handheld. That's kind of cool. So even if it doesn't beat Illumina, it'll, it'll allow you to uh, do sort of real-time monitoring of, of your environment for, you know, to see whether this room is full of H1N1 or something worse, and, uh, and then flee. Uh, and, and so this, this, the, there's the, a, a few different versions of this. The, the two main ones are one where you have a polymerase or helicase motor stripping off one strand that either goes through the pore, this is a, a kind of a conventional single molecule pore ion uh, measurement, such as uh, Sackman and Nehrer, published on in 1975. And here the conductance through the pore is modulated by the single-stranded DNA. And ideally there would be a, a narrow point that would detect one base, typically it's more like four bases. That's so you get kind of blurriness when you have homopolymer runs, but you can see in this published data um, from some of these groups uh, that you can distinguish runs of G's from T's, C's, and A's. They each have their distinctive picoampere conductance. 
That's one way of doing it. Uh, but you're kind of smearing together about four bases at a time. So really, to really distinguish it, you'd have to be able to discriminate 256 different uh, levels. The alternative way of doing it um, is to, instead of running it past, sorry, running the single strand of DNA through the pore, you can run it past the pore where the polymerase is stepping along, and now you're detecting the presence of a triphosphate uh, rather than uh, the, the, the uh, single strand DNA itself. And then only as the triphosphate goes by does it uh, perturb the signal. And I'll show you, so, so instead of getting these uh, where you don't drop the baseline in between bases, you get something where you do drop the baseline in between. So these are intentionally difficult sequence homopolymers again, four Gs, four As, four Ts, color coded with green, red, and blue. And you can see here in between, you get these four Gs, and in between it drops or goes back up the baseline at 225 picoamperes. And they're discrete zones uh, for the, these, these three uh, types of uh, bases. Now that, that so this is a contrast of those two methods. Genia is the second one uh, where you have a polymerase um, doing primer extension. As in each base as it goes by, has a long tail with a polymeric tag. The original polymers were polyethylene glycol. The new polymers are actually nucleic out DNA. So it's a little confusing. You've got, you've got DNA, doubles, partially double-stranded DNA being red, and DNA tagged on to the polyphosphate on the end of each triphosphate. But anyway, it, it dangles in like a fishing line and then it gets detected as they go by. And this has the, the advantage that the, the, that the rate of this can essentially be very similar to the rate of the more complex machines that weigh about half a ton, like the PacBio or the Illumina. But it can fit on this little chip. Most of the action is happening in this little chip, which is now 128,000 pores in the, in the case of Genia. And could and will scale up to 10 million very soon. Um, and then this is a little picture from our 1995 patent, which looks very similar to how we're actually doing it today. So one of the things, so that's just very speculative. Uh, you know, still they are now. Both of them are available. They're in labs being beta tested. Uh, they're producing uh, data. Uh, the the Oxford nanopore has produced data on the order of, for E. coli and yeast. And the genia is about a few years behind them, um, but it's you know really just a few months behind behind them in terms of uh, producing uh, uh, data. Now you can say, well, if we if we keep uh, having this super uh, steep uh, exponential growth in capabilities, beating Moore's law, then uh, then surely we're going to have problems with computing and with storage and with interpretation and a bunch of other things. And uh, so let's tackle that question of big data, data storage in a, in a typically quirky way. So uh, at the begin, sort of in the early days of, uh, of these sequencing by synthesis where you'd have these uh, sort of randomly distributed uh, of uh, uh, amplified single molecules, each one of them be yielding fluorescent data. Um, and so they weren't ideally gridded, and they were, you, were, you would have to collect quite a few image pixels for each uh, piece of DNA. And so you'd, you'd, you'd have to collect hun maybe 100 bytes of information in order to get one base pair, because some, a lot of them were black, a lot of them you had to collect around it to make sure it was separated from other um, uh, data. And then you'd do it 30x coverage, which we already mentioned was, would sort of uh, cause many people at the beginning of the project to freak out because it was 30x. Anyway, it's on the order of terabytes, many terabytes. But then, if you look in the, lit, the computer science literature, that if you do a really good job of sequencing, if you really get uh, accurate enough sequencing that you, can, that you can boldly throw away the image data, um, you can get it down to 2.5 megabytes so instead of 10 to the 13th bytes on the order of 10 to the 6th bytes uh, to store it relative to a reference. Um, and so, uh, you know, and here's the reference on that, the reference, the relative to the reference genome sequence, because you're just storing the differences, basically. You still have to store the reference, but that's small compared to this. And so if we wanted to store the entire human 
population of human genomes, so 7 billion times 6 billion, it's only 2 petabytes, so 2 times 10 to the 15th uh, bytes, which is pathetic. I mean, you know, the, the Internet uh, in, a, in a day will be using up uh, 1,000 times that much uh, uh, in traffic, and even, uh, even fairly simple, uh, you know, computers um, uh, handle this amount. And that's, that's the entire human race. And in fact, we've gotten to the point where, uh, uh, partly as an effort at, at irony, uh, when people used to ask me, how are you going to store all this data, I eventually said, well, I'll store it in DNA. And then I said, well, I should take myself seriously. And so we started storing digital information that was not DNA sequencing into DNA, so kind of reversing the flow of information. And this, this is something I did with my own hands here. I am with purple gloves. And I was, I was advised by my postdoctoral fellow, uh, Sri Kasari. So when he gave his job talk, he said I was his best postdoc uh, so far. And I said I was also his worst postdoc so far. But anyway, I got, I got first author on this science paper. And then since then, <laughs> we're, we're, uh, uh, we're, we're now scaling up to do, we're doing a, vi a, a video with a, a major European uh, data archiving company. And uh, Shri at UCLA is doing an album for uh, a, uh, a, uh, an amazing uh, musical team called OK Go, for those of you who appreciate music. So, OK, so we've got data storage, but uh, not quite handled, but, uh, but it's, I've shown you some of the issues around it. Data sharing's got to be even worse, uh, and it's, and it's you know, it's worse not just because it's big data, but because it's big human data. Um, so I was just going to quickly go through, uh, uh, Jason uh, mentioned this, and I don't want to hammer too hard on it. Uh, um, but here's an example uh, of the Personal Genome Project, which, which Jason mentioned, is now part of, was chosen by the National Institute of Standards Technology and the Food and Drug Administration in a whimsical project they call the Genome in a Bottle uh, Dot org, which is uh, to set standards anytime any new company wants to develop a new diagnostic, a new instrument, a new uh, protocol, uh, and they, they want to make sure that their tests that they're doing, uh, you know, can be compared to other tests from previous and future uh, methods. Uh, they'd like to know that they, their bottle of DNA came from the same prep of DNA. So they're doing uh, 24 of these, so eight trios, two parents and a child, and they looked all over the world for suitable samples, and I wouldn't be telling you this if they did, hadn't picked ours as, the, as the, uh, the, the only project that was properly consented for re-identification and commercial use. And so all of the reference genomes will be uh, from these eight trios, which are uh, intentionally very diverse in ancestral origin. And then there are many other projects that have benefited from this. We've done, we've worked with NIH in code, which is a way of looking at all kinds of epigenetic data, and there'll be more on that later, but we've provided them with billion, literally billions of cells uh, so they can characterize uh, fibroblast stem cells, neurons, and so on, which was previously very hard for them to do. So now why is this project uh, useful to so many groups? And it is because it is totally shareable. It is the most shareable data set and cells and synthetic biology on the planet, um, possibly the world's only open access data set that combines medical data and genomic data. And that's because the way they consented, they have to get 100 percent on an exam. It's a very simple exam at this point. It wasn't when it started. Uh, when we started the IRB, we wanted us to have everybody have a PhD in genetics, which I'm glad we passed through that phase quickly. <laughs> That's no longer the case. We have regular people. And we have these uh, biobank that includes stem cells, not limited to them, mostly through Coriel. And so here's some, some of, of my cells that have been redifferentiated, uh, so dedifferentiated in stem cells and redifferentiated into neuronal rosettes. That's one of our favorite. Uh, and then individual bipolar neurons. Um, and then this is the, this is my original brain uh, before it was sliced uh, uh, by fMRI. Um, that was all virtual slicing, not actual slicing. Right? And then, and then we, and it's the other reason the project is is good is because you can keep adding additional. The more data that accumulates, uh, 
the more valuable that cohort becomes, and so more uh, this, uh, groups want to do phenotyping and other uh, measurements, uh, molecular and otherwise. And so this has been um, recently launched as Open Humans Project, uh, which includes these three groups, but, but it's much more than this. At the annual GET conference, we've uh, had up to 26 different uh, tests being done on the people real time during the conference, um, all sorts of measurements that they do at least annually. Okay, so uh, in, you know, in addition to data storage and data sharing, is this, uh, once you have data sharing, you know, you're in a much better position to look for variants of unknown significance. You, uh, this, is a, this is like the big gorilla in the room when it comes to clinical use of all this wonderful big data. How do we get at variants of unknown significance? I think that everything we've been talking about so far is needed for that. You need to be able to do genome comparisons. You need to have high quality genome sequence, not shortcuts. You need storage and, and sharing. But how do we deal with this big gorilla of variance of unknown significance? Some people feel that we really can't make progress without uh, cohorts with N of 10,000 or more. The fact is that on a regular basis, we are forced to deal with cohorts of N equal 1. For example, this uh, young uh, child, uh, seven months old, who was born with biostatin double null. And rather than this being a truly unfortunate thing that you might expect of a double null of a highly conserved gene, it resulted in him basically having the musculature of Schwarzenegger coming straight out of uh, uh, his mother. And then, but what you do when you have an N equal 1 problem, which is almost all the time, in a certain sense we all are unique, um, is you switch from correlation methods to causality methods. And one of the ways you do that is via animal models. This, in this case, uh, three different, uh, wildly different uh, mammals, uh, cows, dogs, and, and mice, and they all give exactly the same phenotype or very similar phenotypes that, that, uh, of enhanced muscle growth, decreased body fat, and decreased atherosclerosis. But that, those are animal models. The other alternatives that we have, uh, sh slightly short of work of doing experiments on human beings, which is really is much harder uh, reg in a regulatory sense uh, to get uh, and, and uh, very hard to do for checking causality of uh, deleterious alleles, um, is this is looking at organs or organoids. So these are uh, uh, diverse now, and, uh, and, and uh, at the Wies Institute, Don Ingber and uh, Kit Parker have, have, and, and we and others have worked together in other institutes as well to create about a dozen such uh, tissues. Some of them are uh, much, uh, even though they're quite simple still, they're much more sophisticated than the tissue culture, which has essentially been static for about a, a century, which is just putting, you know, spreading cells in a monolayer on plastic, um, the tissue culture meter. For example, you get the mechanical forces of a lung, which it's very important that it, this is pulses uh, in a rhythmic way, where by pu pulsing in air on the, in the, is the top layer, um, and then epithelial cells in the boundary layer, and then endothelial cells, and then blood or blood substitute. And, as this, and you can even have uh, these little red dots indicate bacterial <laughs> particles that, ca uh, that can go in or uh, phagocyte uh, cells that can go out through the endothelium and the epithelium and, and interact with the bacteria. Similarly, in the gut, uh, on the chip, uh, also has bacteria. And, you, and normally, I just, for those of you who don't do tissue culture, it's not common practice to put bacteria in with your mammalian cells. It's uh, generally uh, frowned upon, uh, and that's why you put pin strep in the media. But these, these are close enough to real that you can uh, you can do that sort of thing. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you a specific anecdote from the, the, the contractile <coughs> heart um, on a chip where a substrate has been made so you can get a fairly large contractile uh, 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 organoid and, uh, and test it. Now you can think of there's two kind of reciprocal things that one can do with um, 
genome engineering. One of them is gene therapy, where you, you fix a deficit, and the other is uh, modeling to determine a variance of unknown significance. Uh, this, and uh, our, our favorite uh, strategy these days for doing this is uh, called CRISPR or Cas9. Um, I'm not going to go into that in much detail. Uh, hopefully, many of you have heard about it. Um, but the idea is we start with these shareable cells, like PGP1 or cells from my um, fibroblast from my left arm, which have been, been turned into uh, normal human induced pluripotent stem cells, and then into cardiomyocytes. And we do this with a, a piggyback excisable uh, Cas9. The Cas9 is the protein that does the genome editing. Um, it's, it's doxycycline inducible, and there's a guide RNA that allows, and a pair oligos. So you've got these four components coming together, the genome, the, the guide RNA, which recognizes the genome, the Cas9 that does the cleavage as a protein, uh, and then the repair oligo that will go in and change it to whatever you want. And that allows you to test the hypothesis that out of six billion base pairs, this G missing is causing this devastating disease, Barth syndrome, which has cardiomyopathy, defective cardiolipin, uh, and, and, and uh, mitochondrial impact. and morphological and, and uh, contractile consequences. So that one G on the X chromosome, we can do a, a control, which is a mock modified, no unmodified genome, and then uh, one where we left out the donor DNA, the repair oligo. So basically you cut, but there's nothing to repair it, so the cell does its best by either inserting or deleting. In this case, it inserted eight base pairs. So that's a, a kind of a deleterious control. Zero is the uh, base pair is the original. So this is, uh, so we, we take these stem cells that we've, we've altered with the CRISPR technology, either one base pair, zero base pairs, uh, or, or plus eight, and you can see the normal where we haven't changed the genome has this beautiful styrated uh, um, uh, uh, cardiomyocyte-based uh, uh, tissue which uh, con contracts, I'm not going to show you the movie, but it contracts at, at sort of the normal contraction rate, as it turns out. And then these are either disordered morphologically, the contraction is disordered as well. This was done in collaboration with William Poo, and uh, he did the, oops, uh, he did the um, uh, uh, clinical part, and Kit Parker, who did some of the organoid uh, part. And then to complete the proof that this one base pair is uh, the causative base pair, you can complement it in trans by putting in a messenger RNA for the TAS gene um, and getting restoration of this fairly well-ordered and, and normal contractile motion, as well as the cardiolipin and the mitochondrial. Now, I've kind of casually said that we changed one base pair in the genome, and uh, it used to be that, that when you would change one base pair in a genome, even for a very easy organism with a small genome like E. coli, you would change that base pair and you might PCR it and then see that it's been changed. And that would be considered pretty fanatic to really, you know, prove that you changed it. But then, but what, what my students do now is they sequence the entire genome, even if it's a human genome, to make sure they didn't change something else. Um, and they'll do this multiple times for each clone gets a separate sequence. And sometimes you learn something from doing that. Uh, and, uh, and in fact, it's, you know, one of the questions about the CRISPR technology, since it's so new, it's only about two years and a couple of months old, is what is the, what is the off-target? And so we have rules, computational rules, that, that uh, are quite sophisticated, but as a rule of thumb that help you, you know, for, fit it on one slide, is we try to for the on target has zero mismatches, I mean, perfect match, and we try to avoid one or two because there is a chance if you have one or two mismatches uh, you, it, elsewhere in the genome, you, the CRISPR will cleave there. And then three is hard to avoid, so you tolerate some of those, but it will cleave there as well. And the frequency is about 5 percent. That is to say, if you collect together enough clones, 5 percent of the clones will have one off target. Um, or if you do it in a mixed population. But in this particular case, uh, the, the software that we, that we had written and were using um, for various uh, 
complicated uh, pragmatic reasons used as the reference genome. I mean, we knew better. We had the reference genome for this thing. In fact, it's my genome. And we knew, but nevertheless, the reference genome that was used for designing this experiment was, uh, you know, something uh, anonymous out there and, you know, they just picked it up off the internet somewhere. And, uh, and it turns out that that reference genome does not have a SNP on chromosome 5 that I have. So I'm heterozygous at this position. It's just some piece of junk DNA out there happens to have this, you know, well-characterized SNP, or uh, at least it's got a name. I guess that's, that's not really characterized. And what we were aiming for is chromosome X, deleting 1G, and instead this thing made a mess out here because the, the um, and so there is a, a site there, and it is a huge background. So it's 36.7 percent of the mutations that we found um, relative to a little over 50 percent for the intended mutations. 36.7 were off target because we used the wrong genome. So the lesson here is if you're going to do this kind of thing, at least right now at the current state of play, um, which will change in the next slide, but at the current state of play, uh, uh, you should use the right genome for designing your CRISPR. Not so much because, not just because of the site you're trying to change, but all the sites you're trying to not change, okay? But like I say, uh, reality is going to change in just a moment here. But why is it important? What are we really worried about? You might see a lot in the literature, a lot of people obsessing about off targets for, for CRISPR, uh, which I still haven't really shown you or told you about. Yeah, hopefully you know about it. Um, it's just, it's a yet another gene therapy. In particular, it's a yet another genome editing subset of gene therapy rather than transgenic. And what, but what happened in gene therapy in general between 1996 and 2003 from this same group is they went from, you know, kind of ecstatic curing of so many patients with, with uh, SCID X1 um, to uh, two of the patients dying, P P4 and P5, because they had insertions of the um, vector uh, uh, containing the, the uh, extra copy of this gene that was missing, and it, it, these ins they were inserting randomly all over the genome, and, and, two, and two of the places that really you don't want it to insert is next to the OM02 oncogene, which was then activated and, uh, and caused cancer. And these people's immune system were not in great shape to start out with. So what are we worried about for, for Cas9? Well, there are two kinds of Cas9, or many kinds of Cas9 therapy, but two, <laughs> two classes we'll talk about is nuclease or, or repression, that is to say inactivation. Um, and I just showed you an, ex uh, uh, an example. Uh, uh, you would not want it to cleave and inactivate accidentally or on, uh, in any of the hundreds of tumor suppressor genes. I give a range here depending on which literature you're looking at. And there's a similar number of human oncogenes and for experiments where, where you have a dead Cas9 or DCAS9 uh, with an activation domain on it, you can activate a gene that you want to do gene therapy on. And if it's off target onto oncogene, you would activate that oncogene. And so it would be bad just like the, the problems that we had at the dawn of gene therapy in 1999. So if you, if you do the math, and we don't need to really walk through it, but if you did full body delivery, which is kind of a worst case gene therapy situation, uh, you've got this large number of, of cells, um, you know, 10 trillion, and then you've got fairly small mutational windows assumed here for the either tumor suppressors or oncogenes, and, you know, and it's diploid. And it ends up that you want around two times 10 to the 19th base pairs. The best. Uh, and this is not widely celebrated. I'm, I'm trying to celebrate uh, this from another group, Keith Young's group, with whom we've collaborated. They recently published the best known uh, level of off-target, which is zero off-targets in 3 times 10 to the 14th base pair. So getting close to, well, it's better than, we don't know how much better than uh, 3 times 10 to the 14th base pairs it is. Uh, we're starting, to, our methods of detection of these off-targets are starting to fail us. But anyway, we'd like to do, um, this will have to eventually give way to large, uh, either large animals or large numbers of small animals, and then eventually human tests. Now, all of that changes again 
if we can improve the specificity. So that's with kind of almost off the shelf CRISPR from nature. You can change it in various ways, theoretical, empirical, dose optimization, which, which happened at the, the dawn of CRISPR technology when it was first applied to a non-bacterial sequence in uh, January 2013. But then more recently, paired NICases and, and other paired dimeric nucleases messing around with the length of the RNA and, again, the dose um, res can result in many orders of magnitude improvement <laughs> in specificity off the chart of that, is, which is already hard to measure at three times 10 to the 14th. So maybe a thousandfold better, maybe more. It, we could be that we're already where we need to be. Now, I'm just going to end this section on variants of unknown significance with a discussion of the most common disease, because the variants of unknown significance often happen in, in fairly uh, rare, but also common. And the most common disease, one that uh, all of you have, uh, probably, um, is this uh, death due to aging, and, uh, and so, uh, and this Gaussian drops to such a low level that you can barely detect the, the tiny tail of it here, where between, between the ages of 110 and 120 are about 70 people in the world, steady state. They, they pass on and they're replaced by other old people. Uh, but this is uh, remarkable. Uh, these are some of them. We, we, we've been uh, part of a consortium that's the sequence, about half of them, uh, so, and, uh, and if, you know, I can hear, see some smiles here, um, it, the lesson here is not that you should be smoking and drinking and <laughs> eating lots of cake, uh, but that, that they have lifestyles at least as bad as ours, and that they're, and they may have some uh, extreme um, alleles that, uh, that help them out. So we'd like to study that. And in the meantime, we have many other uh, ways of getting at potential variants of unknown significance or variants that we might want to harness in various ways. And this is a, a completely different approach to that, that problem of rejuvenation or reversal of aging where you uh, do heterochronic parabiosis where you suture together the circulatory systems of a young and old mouse. Um, don't try this with your kids. Uh, it, 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 and, and you find factors, and you, these can lead, you, that, that cause rejuvenation of the, uh, the brains, the um, vasculature, the skeletal and cardiac muscle, and then you can, you can use this super biological assay to get at more biochemical uh, components, and one of the first ones, and, and early ones uh, st still, uh, uh, is GDF11, sample of a protein and a gene that reverses uh, many of these uh, age-related uh, problems. In addition to that, there's uh, progress in using, um, uh, messing around with the telomerase uh, enzymatic activity, and also with uh, third uh, category, and there are many others, uh, that uh, looking at ho mitochondrial homeostasis, you can influence this via small molecules like nicotinamide, which is actually quite Expensive at the at the because of the way it's administered and the, and the, uh, and the, how frequently you have to do it, it's uh, prohibitively expensive so far. That could change, but an alternative way is to do uh, gene therapy on the gene that's just upstream from it. Now, this is not the nuclease or or genome editing that I showed earlier. This is an epig epigenetic uh, modification, and and in this so in this case we're picking something that's very close to to this uh, the heart of this nicotinamide. Um, metabolic, uh, metabolic changes. So, for example, in mice, between 8, 6, and uh, 22 months, it drops by about a little over a factor of 2, and you'd like to be able to return that uh, or get, it, get complete control over a, a wide range. So we carpet bombed uh, the promoter upstream from the transcription start site of TFAM, which is just in that pathway I just showed you, hoping that some of, knowing that, that, that CRISPR activators and for that matter, CRISPR nucleases as well, vary from site to site in the genome. And so you, you do your best computationally, uh, both uh, to avoid off targets, but also to maximize on target. And, and, uh, and since this slide was made, we have much better software that can avoid some of these low uh, activity sites. But in any case, back then, uh, you know, back in the ancient days of, of CRISPR two months ago, um, 
we, we would do it empirically, where we would basically uh, synthesize all these different uh, guide RNAs. It's very simple. It's just 20 base pairs, so you really can make hundreds of thousands of them. Doing four is no big deal. I don't want to be sounding heroic here. Um, but you can see one of them is a lot better. One of the four sites we target is a lot better. We got a little over 47-fold uh, activation of the TFAM gene using the endogenous DNA. We don't even have to use real regulatory sequences. We can just make it up the cis-regulatory sequences by putting in this completely synthetic trans-regulatory element that comes from bacteria called CRISPR. Anyway, we get a 47-fold effect, which has a huge impact on the NAD levels here, not the two-fold effect that you see during aging, but a tenfold. So we can dial that back down the two-fold if that's the appropriate uh, level. So this is, uh, but that's a 47-fold effect. There are other cases where we might want to have more, and uh, and sure enough, uh, Alex Chavez, um, jo Jonathan Scheim, and, and Sue Vora um, uh, from our group uh, set out to do that for, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, one of them having to do, we were trying to do neurogenesis. And the, the kind of the standard at the time, VP64 activation domain, fused onto this dead Cas9, meaning dead with respect to nuclease, but live with respect to recognition of the genome. If you put on three, now, three uh, different activation domains that might bind to different parts of the transcription machinery, um, you get a huge enhancement over just one, any one of them. And in this particular order, is the maximum, and it also gives a nice acronym, which we call VIPER, uh, for, for uh, the first initial of each of these activation domains. And as an example here, you can get um, a 20,000-fold enhancement of Titan. <laughs> Titan is not an arbitrarily chosen gene, it's the largest uh, protein in the human body and, and the largest gene. Just the coding region alone is 100 kilobases, so even if you put on a cDNA, it doesn't fit into most viral vectors. Uh, in fact, it's off by uh, factor 25 from our favorite viral vector. Um, but you can make endogenous sequences into cis-regulatory elements um, and en enhance it by 20,000-fold. And you can do many genes at once, so here we um, are doing three, four genes at once where we just use one activation domain or all three of them, VP and R, and you can get sort of 400 to 4,000-fold activation of four at once. Okay. So after, we now can uh, alter, engineer the, with CRISPR the genome and the epigenome. We now would like to uh, be able to analyze that or just uh, producing big data from large cohorts, we'd like to be able to do that uh, in, in a systematic way where we're not throwing away data, and you'll see what I mean by that in just a moment. So we'd like to collect data on all the major macromolecules, DNA, RNA, protein, and not just counting them or quantitating them, um, and certainly not quantitating them in a mixed cellular population, but, but at determining the proportion in three dimensions subcellularly in, in a multicellular context, and we might call this epigenomic imaging or fluorescent in situ sequencing, which is what we generally call it. And the point is that cells are not generally spheres. They're asymmetric, and they have uh, an asymmetric distribution of proteins and RNA, both uh, going outward radially from the middle of the cell and also along the cell. Here's a axon, uh, sorry, a, a neuron, which is particularly asymmetric, but I think uh, uh, many cells in your body have this asymmetry. So you want subcellular localization, not just grinding up a cell and then scattering the RNA randomly on a flow, sequencing flow cell where you get all the sequence data and even can count it, but you've lost the three-dimensional uh, positions. So here are two human fibroblasts, uh, which, uh, and you can see the nucleus is kind of this uh, brighter uh, circle in the middle. And each of those dots is a single RNA molecule. Uh, which uh, where we uh, can amplify uh, very lightly such that and, and compactly so that all the amplification stays as a really tiny dot, which is smaller than the tighter than the resolution of the, of the microscopes that we use. And uh, basically during cDNA, we, we cross-link them and form a hydro uh, gel, a, po a polymer, which is rigid enough that we can address it over and over again, essentially the same way you would for next-gen sequencing. But it's 
porous enough that the reagents can get in and out. And unlike next gen sequencing, you might, you might just image one layer. In this case, we do confocal where we can image a, a whole Z stack of layers um, all at once. And so it's very efficient in terms of the, the cycling of the reagents. So in principle, this could be uh, even lower cost than conventional sequencing of single cells because uh, you don't have to count each RNA over and over again because they're truly where they belong and you haven't amplified and introduced bias. They're, they're the right number at the right location. And because you're doing this confocal stack, you have uh, less reagents and less um, manipulation. Now here's uh, some examples of some of the quality of the data uh, where we're looking at a fairly long messenger RNA. This is fibronectin from those same fibroblasts. Uh, it's over eight kilobases long. Um, sometimes challenging to study such long uh, cDNAs, but in C2 it's, it's, it's not hard. <coughs> and here, and you can see it's not completely flat, but it's, we have good representation at every position in this histogram where these are reads on the, the y-axis. And this is the first experiment we did in fetal bovine serum, and we were a little um, concerned when we found that exon 25 was completely missing. All the other exons had some uh, reads in them, and, but we pursued to finish the experiment. The experiment was a, was a kind of a wound healing model where you scrape through it and change the media to epidermal growth factor containing media. And fortunately, at that point, we found a lot, uh, quite a few reads from exon 25, and it was an example of a biological, not a technical artifact, but a biological um, <clears throat> alternative splicing, biologically significant. So uh, we would, we are in the process of scaling this, or extending this from RNA to DNA and protein. We have uh, preliminary data on, on each of those. And also to increase the number of reads that we get per cell. Now, to increase the number of reads per cell, uh, we have these three methods that I'm uh, not going to go in great detail about, but molecular stratification is the most powerful of the three, I think, because no matter what your resolution is, so the other two address resolution, but no matter what it is, if you have one pixel or voxel that has your molecules of interest in it and you'd like to get multiple reads from it, by molecular stratification, you can, you can uh, get, you can do a, a sequence read, remove all that information, and then do it again. And so you can get multiple reads from one pixel, which I think is quite a cool trick. There's super resolution. Hopefully everybody's heard of this. You can get from sort of 400 nanometer at the, this diffraction limited to in the order of 10 nanometers under good circumstances. And I think it even um, more, uh, uh, it just brings a smile to my face. Uh, rather than increasing the resolution, you actually just expand your sample. So we, we've been embedding samples in polymers like polyacrylamide for, since, since the 90s. Uh, certain classes of those, of those polymers, like polyacrylate, will expand at low, low ionic strength, and they will expand uh, uniformly in all three dimensions. Um, and so your, your sample is now just plain bigger, and, uh, and all the structure is maintained. And this is work from Ed Boyden's group uh, just published in Science, and we've been collaborating with them for um, about a year on adapting this for fluorescent C2 sequencing. And it has the advantage in, uh, that you can use uh, in, uh, conventional fluorophores and, and uh, confocal microscopes, and to achieve super resolution, uh, you need to query each picture, each fluorophore thousands of times to get, so you get averaging, so you can get, you can find the centroid of that uh, fluorophore. While with uh, this, you, you collect at a thousand times faster rates because you're, you're, do, you're uh, just trying to find uh, the fluorophore in a conventional way. And I just want to end on applying some of these concepts to another big uh, data project, which is the Brain Initiative. This was uh, we were inspired to some extent by this Allen Brain Institute uh, project uh, uh, a few years ago where they did a serial section through the, through the mouse brain um, do, doing one probing of one RNA per, uh, per brain slice. Um, now, the, the, the thing that's inspiring about this is they made it clear that you could uh, do this over and over again. They went through um, over 1,200 brains. In order, in order to get 
about half of the messenger RNA is represented and, and almost none of the non-coding uh, RNAs. But the point is that they could do this over and over and they could get these serial sections and reconstruct the brain. The, so that's the positive side. The, the negative is it's very hard to align these. Uh, you can align them for a given RNA, but uh, two different RNAs coming from two different brains, the no two brains are exactly the same, uh, even though they're from inbred mice. And so you, you can't do a, a, you can do a regional overlap where you say, oh, this is the hippocampus, this is the hypothalamus, but you can't do a, a neuron by neuron. So, so we feel that the in situ sequencing method would allow us to do all the RNAs in one brain, again, same number of serial sections, but instead of 1,200 brains, you could do the same information in one. And we would call this like a Rosetta brain because all the information is, is there, and so the, the big data problem becomes a much simpler problem because it's, it, the problem is not large amounts of data, it's the, uh, the way that it's been done. And so if, you, if, you, if they're already integrated, so then you have <coughs> pixel by pixel alignment already done for you. You don't need to uh, make assumptions and, and skip over things. And that's, that's a Rosetta expression analysis. And so here we have A, B, C, D, E. So you can take the expression analysis and they're perfectly aligned because you did it on one brain. But if you're going to do that, if you can do a Rosetta expression, you might as well do a Rosetta for everything else you might want to know about the mouse or primate, whatever um, behavioral system you're looking at. And so you can measure activity in a method I'm not going to go into right, right now, but it's a, it's a somewhat speculative technology where, where we're trying to encode for uh, uh, ion channel or immediate early messenger RNA uh, activity into nucleic acid so they can determine it later by fluorescent C2 sequencing or behavioral me measurements sort of done in a conventional way. We can get developmental lineage identifiers. These are barcodes that we can develop uh, in s it, during the development of the organism. So each cell, as it divides, it causes uh, diversity at these barcodes, and in, so each, each time there's cell division, you have two daughters that have slightly different barcodes, and it keeps going and going until, in the end, um, the entire uh, mouse or other animal, has, every cell has its own barcode. Then you can use those barcodes to send them out via uh, synapse-specific RNAs out to the synapses, and then every synapse will be marked as the barcode from cell one and the barcode from the cell that it's attached to. Anyway, so we put all these together, you know, activity, behavior, connectome, development, on lineage, and expression, A, B, C, D, E, and, we and that's a real Rosetta brain. It's not just a uh, transcriptome. And some of these things are described in these, uh, you know, high-profile journals like Archive and BioArchive. Um, we're not ashamed to uh, publish in preprints. And, uh, you know, here's some of the numbers, topic of the the, the talk is big data. We don't need to go through all these uh, numbers, but, the, but I think the point of these is not that they're dramatically big numbers, it's they're remarkably bite-sized bites uh, in terms of analyzing all these in one brain of, of a mouse and hopefully uh, many other organisms. So I will, uh, this is what we've been talking about. I'll leave you with this uh, as we go into discussion. Thank you. Well, we, I'd like to thank you for really a fabulous talk. Um, I and just realized I forgot to turn on my microphone. Ah, oh, so and, I and we can probably move over so you're not stuck behind the, yeah. you know, stuck behind the, the left turn. Um, and I'm delighted that you talked about my favorite topic, of course, at the end, all of the, all of the implications for this for our most complicated organs. Um, I think there we'll take questions from the audience. Are there, is there, are there any? And then we also were tweeting and things. Yeah, maybe yeah. we'll wait. There's the people going to have to turn over here as the, uh, lots of people want to stay for the, to hear the words of wisdom but don't have any questions. <laughs> so the people without any questions just leave. Without <laughs> <laughs>
but yeah, we can start. So uh, people who have questions, just come up uh, to the microphones. And I know that was a tour de force of uh, an amazing amount given. Um, that was a really impressive talk. And maybe the one thing, since I'm not so computationally minded, um, you drew a lot of curves showing Moore's law and how accumulation of data and knowledge works. If you had to plot the understanding on this, what would it look like? So the question is, uh, how, do we, how would we plot understanding and, uh, and what would it look like? I would say that uh, at the part of that curve where we were still on Moore's Law, sort of in the 90s and uh, beginning of 2000, there were one or two or a handful of genes that were clinically useful and alleles, um, most notably in 1991, the first few uh, were in BRCA1 and BRCA2. And, uh, and I would not claim that everything that they diagnose in, in that company, which is one of the most mature ones, is accurate. Uh, many are still variants of unknown significance, but uh, it, that, that number now has gone from two genes to about 4,000 genes that are in, in, in uh, some sort of uh, use. And, the, and for many of these, they're now uh, uh, orphan drugs. Um, you know, goes a little bit beyond understanding to, to, uh, to act therapeutic action. And then, of course, gene genetic counseling is used in many of these cases uh, to uh, reduce uh, uh, diseases such as Tay-Sachs without therapy but with, via counseling. I don't, I mean, I, I'm not being as numeric or as quantitative as the, uh, the plots on sequencing because it is hard to measure understanding, but I think it is thousands of genes now, uh, but we're transitioning to um, multiple genes per person, multiple variants uh, interacting in gene environment interactions. Uh, and that's, I think that's the, the, the next set of goals. But, it, but we've made, a, I, I think, a great deal of progress since 1991. So I guess the one goal, exactly. <laughs> the one goal um, I did see quite clearly was the aging um, living longer as yeah. an endpoint goal. So in an ideal world, what would be your finally you've hit your goal in the bigger picture? Yeah, the, the, the goal for that? No, the goal in general, if you made the world better with your oh. technique, what would it be? Uh, well, uh, you know, it, they're, they're medical goals set by the community, not by me, uh, but they're certainly in developing nations. I mean, I have a, a bunch of slides I didn't show on on malaria, and uh, and those there, there, that could have quite an impact. Uh, aging reversal, I think, would in, would eventually impact everybody, um, and those would be it, those those categories of diseases are very, would, would be uh, high on my list. But it's not exhaustive. I mean, we're trying to make it, uh, enabling technologies that that anybody can use on their worst case diseases. Yeah, so Judy Cho. Um, so you closed with talking about sequencing at the tissue side in pathology, and inherently that makes a lot of sense to me when you think about pathology as typically you're just analyzing cells based on morphology. So how do you see the real sweet spot for marrying nucleic acid analyses with disease or health at the tissue level? I mean, when cells, for example, can be either replicating or not replicating in the process of just being newly recruited to that site versus about to die. I mean, how do you see leveraging nucleic acid analyses particularly being valuable in, at the tissue level? Right, so uh, the fluorescent in situ sequencing is something that in principle can be used on any, uh, all of or any subset of DNA, RNA, and protein. And so to the extent that you have any insight into the state of a cell, uh, based on any of those molecules, you should be able to do it better uh, the more you do simultaneously. Uh, I realize that's not a detailed answer because it would be a case by case depending on the pathology. You know, knowing how re recently a cell came into a site, I think that's, uh, I mean, you know, it's, the, the tool should make it easier. I'm not saying it makes it easy. Okay. 
or like repli active replication well, versus not? Um, yeah. Well, replication, uh, I think that would be a piece of cake. Yeah. yeah. But migration, I don't know. It's just kind of out of my uh, expertise. Vlad? So going back <laughs> to the introduction that Jason did and the picture of the woolly mammoth, uh, what are the, some of the concerns that you face in the synthetic biology field as it regards with regards to bioethics and potentially security? Not necessarily focusing on the woolly mammoth itself. Uh, the concerns of synthetic biology in environmental settings, is that the question? Or That's part of the question, but are there any security concerns that you have faced? So, so we've addressed uh, you know, many ethical and policy issues along the way. I mean, if you're part of uh, new technology, it's an uh, obligation. Uh, in 2004 or 2005, uh, I raised the issue of the, the new chip-based DNA synthesis, which is about 1,000 times cheaper, could enable synthesis of viruses and maybe even uh, bacterial, large bacterial uh, sequences. And so I proposed that we uh, in, incorporate computational tools for uh, surveying uh, all the orders of synthetic DNA for select agents. Um, and it seems obvious that you should do that, but back then it wasn't so obvious. And, but now it is fairly routine for most of the large synthesis companies to do that kind of computational check. It's not perfect, uh, but that's, that's an example of a security issue. Uh, I think that the, the gene drives that, we've, that we hope to use on, on malaria uh, have to be brought out very carefully because they are uh, they're intentionally spreading. It's not a virus. It's, it's purely spread by sexual transmission in mosquitoes. But, um, you know, you, you, there's lots of, this is not so much security, but safety and efficacy uh, at an environmental level, uh, the same way that you might be concerned about it on an individual level in, in drug um, therapeutic type testing. Thank you. Maybe you could describe more about the gene drive and malaria. You didn't talk about it. Yeah, I didn't. It's a hot, yeah, a hot uh, area yeah. That, yeah. You're, that, yeah. that's being talked about and you're getting a lot of Yeah, I, I can, I can do it without slides. Uh, basically, it uses the CRISPR, or the, the way we pref our preferred implementation uses the CRISPR uh, cutting that, that I did describe uh, to deliver a cassette. It's a selfish DNA that doesn't just jump all over the place like transposons, but only converts the, loca the locus that it's in. So when you get a mating with a wild organism, the modified one will convert that locus in all the offspring, so you get 100% inheritance rather than normal Mendelian 50%. And the consequence is in, say, mosquitoes, where you have hundreds of offspring for mating and, and uh, dozens of matings per uh, season, uh, you can get... Uh, exponential spread of a cassette along with the so-called selfish DNA that, that where the cassette con confers malaria resistance to mosquito. In principle, you could also drive the mosquito to extinction, but a more conservative and equally plausible route is to make them so they're resistant to, uh, to the malaria parasite. And if they're not carrying it, then the human eventually it will dissipate from the human population. And once, it, if it does get to that point, then it's like smallpox and polio. Humans are the only mammalian reservoir, unlike flu, and so you you would it would be a permanent solution to that. So that's how that's roughly speaking how gene drives work, and they could be used uh, to either introduce herbicide resistance or pesticide resistance, or or drive to extinction invasive species such as uh, rodents, which are killing off uh, ma the major source of extinction on islands. In the world. But I guess the, the concern that is often expressed is how do you control the gene exactly. drive, yeah. right? So, so we, before we brought out our first experiment, so we've done our first experiment in yeast, uh, we emphasize the importance of physical containment, uh, ecological containment, that is to say don't do it where if, uh, you know, the, the mosquito can get and breed with mosquitoes in the immediate population uh, surrounding the lab. And then genetic uh, isolation, where you can have the gene drive decoupled from the Cas9 the Cas and the guide RNA can be separated so that if it does get into the wild, it won't uh, have an impact. And so we've, we've proven, and, and also there's gene drive reversal mechanisms. So we've proven all of these things work, all these safety mechanisms work. 
continues now. But we still need more discussion and more, and it's certainly a lot of caution in using it in other organisms. We were concerned that people would accidentally invent gene drives, mm -hmm. and that has more or less happened a couple of times now since we published the paper in July. Victor uh, my question is a little bit um, futuristic. Uh, what do you think when we will have, when we will be able to edit uh, genome, like in mole molecular eugenic, uh, molecular eugenic approach when we can revisit eugenics? Oh, eugenics. Yes, and edit off bad mutations from the humans. Well, so. So modern, you know, so eugenics is a complicated term because it really applied to many nations in the 30s through the 60s, including the United States, Canada, and Europe, uh, and it really reflected the government sterilization of individuals against their will. Uh, a modern version of that could 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 mean mean literally good genes. It could include uh, parents making decisions, uh, reproductive decisions which you might call gene, genetic counseling, which happens all the time. Parents making decisions uh, at the PGD IVF stage, which is more, more technologically significant but the same goal of uh, making sure you have healthy babies. Um, where the gut, in that case, to fight genet or fight that kind of good genes, the government would have to once again interfere with the parents' uh, decision making. Uh, but you I guess you're, so you so then, uh, it, in addition to kind of conventional gene count, genetic counseling and IVF s selection, you could do alteration, and you could do that either at the adult, at the child, or germline. And it sort of de facto, uh, 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 on the ground, uh, a changing an adult would, would have many of the same properties of changing a germline. That is to say, you, you could alter their physiology, um, but, but people draw a line right now um, between the two, which I think partly uh, reflects I, 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 safety. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, we know that there are mutations that cause some uh, diseases, yeah. and uh, in theory, we, we would be able to edit these uh, mutations of the yes. uh, gene, of right. the geno uh, genome of the uh, individual. Right. So when do you think we will be that so at stage. the somatic level, so the no, changing no, at, the, at the embryonic, at but you the embryonic could, level. but you would only do it at the embryonic level if you can't do it at the somatic level, or if it's less safe or more or way more expensive, right? So this gene therapies, there are two thousand gene therapies already in clinical trials. So you, so th so there's a lot that can be done at the somatic level. Um, sometimes you move it earlier, uh, for example, for blindness. If you don't cure blindness at an early enough age, they're not going to actually be able to see well or do. Uh, recognize. Um, so there will be advantages of doing it earlier and earlier, and I think there will be, be a, a, a lot of discussion uh, that's based on uh, how serious is the illness and is there any other way of doing it. But if you end up with very serious illnesses and there's no other way of doing it or they're less safe or much more expensive, then I, I think that it will go through normal clinical trials. Uh, great talk, very interesting, a lot of things to think about. I have a question about the brain uh, things you were talking about, and the question really is, is, is that, you know, to focus on the human brain where it's, it's so, so complicated, I wonder if there, if there are any, um, any thought to try to use these techniques of, of doing all the different kinds of data that you can gather on some more simple uh, model systems where, where you might be able to actually figure out some of the circuits in those systems which then could inform how you try to go about looking at these things in the human. Right. So, so all of the numbers in the Rosetta that I was talking about was in, aimed at the mouse or small primates. Um, so you would get, you, 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 there are opportunities for doing this early on uh, in those animals that would be hard to do in humans. In humans, we do have a lot of electrode-based uh, therapies and to some extent experiments that, that tag along on those therapies, deep brain stimulation for epilepsy and depression, uh, electrode arrays for, for retina and cochlear implants. Uh, they're very crude and the hope is to improve those, but if you do the math, if you wanted to really affect a truly large number of 
read and, and or write to a large number of neurons. It's very hard to do that with electrical or optical stimulation. Uh, you can get anywhere close to all the neurons. Um, and so the synthetic biology approach that, that I just barely scratched the surface of there, I think has promise. It'll be worked, it'll obviously have to be worked out in, in mice and primates first. Uh, but the point is that synthetic biology is well matched um, to interfacing with, with the various mammalian brains because of the energy consumption and the size of the elements that you can use. So the electrodes uh, and optical methods are off by about five or six orders of magnitude in terms of energy consumption and size, while synthetic biology is right on, right on target. But it's, it's still very early stages. You showed off-target effects of CAS-CRISPR uh, during your talk. Uh, and I might have a little bit of variation of what the gentleman before me was asking. If, what is uh, your perspective, what are your thoughts to germline editing in human and with respect to off-target effects? Is it something which is actually technologically pretty close or is it still like a log ahead? Okay, so I will give you my quirky opinion, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, that if you're concerned about off-target, if you treat somebody, let's say, systemically. So our lab is publishing on systemic delivery of adeno-associated mm -hmm. virus to every cell in the body. And there might be certain diseases where you would want to do that. Or just maybe not everyone, but, but mm -hmm. some large sampling, large number of cells. You have, whatever the off-target is, it's multiplied by the number of cells that you do. Mm -hmm. So if you do the whole body, the older you get, the more cells there are. Mm -hmm. If you engineer a, a progenitor for sperm cells, let's say, in, in, in lab, mm -hmm. you can do that clonally so that all the sperm are derived from a particular clone, uh, maybe prebiotic. Uh, and so they all have, so all the off target can be characterized on that clone before you differentiate them into meiotic and, mm -hmm. and, and eventually sperm. So uh, you could imagine that that's much safer for the, for the offspring because you've sequenced the entire genome of, of the progenitor for all of those cells. While if you do it in a conventional uh, in vivo uh, viral delivery or, or non-viral delivery, you have lots of opportunities for off-target. So even if your off-target is as low as I said we're aiming for, 10 to the minus 14th, 10 to the minus 19th, uh, you still are taking a risk that you wouldn't take if you actually sequence the genome mm -hmm. of a progenitor of a stem. So I, I, I think it's too early to, to say one is safer than the other. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that the concerns about germline are right now all tangled with safety. As soon as safety is addressed, I think uh, we'll have a different discussion. I don't mm -hmm. know what that discussion will be, but it'll be different. Okay. Thanks. Hi. Um, this is also a follow-up to the question, um, previous question, how far are we um, technologically, um, in your view, from uh, applying germline editing in, um, in the clinic? Right. Well, so you, some people would argue that mitochondrial uh, gene therapy is a form. It's not editing. Uh, I think the prerequisites probably sh should be, maybe will be. Uh, getting it to work very well somatically. So uh, right now there's a very small number of clinical trials on, on editing somatically, like uh, the Sangamo CCR5 uh, gene editing is in phase two clinical trials. Uh, so that will have to expand and we get a great deal of confidence. We, we figure out whether there's any cancer caused by off-target uh, and doing it, if the, 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 the closer we get to full system systemic delivery to in all the adult cells, the, the, the higher our, our uh, confidence is that it won't be uh, affecting the diverse set of cells in the embryo. But, and then there'll be germline editing of animals, not just for science, but for agricultural applications. And if all of that comes together, your question is when? Will that all come together? I think we'll be doing clinical trials in human somatic in probably in a year and a half. Um, 
We're already doing some gene editing with zinc finger nucleases, but with CRISPR in a year and a half. And then um, I would say probably another five years or so before we're ready to, uh, to tackle it um, in, in a, in a well-chosen case where it's, it's very risky to do it any other way. So for everybody, it's going to be a while. Like the general applicability. Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm talking about getting us from here to exactly. phase, phase no, right. one is at least five years, and it would be a very, deli very deleterious case. Yeah. So the fluorescence in situ sequencing is very impressive. Um, and I know it builds on a lot of previous work from your lab, but I was wondering how long did it take to actually get that working? And uh, have other labs brought up a system like that and used it? Right. So, yeah, good question. Less, it took less time than nanopore sequencing, so <laughs> which is uh, saying that it's second worst uh, performance uh, timing. Uh, so we, our first paper that mentioned the word fluorescent C2 sequencing was 1999, so it predated what most people call next-gen sequencing. Uh, but it clearly is part of next-gen sequencing. It was one of the motivations that we had for developing next-gen sequencing. Well, but the nanopore goes back to 89, uh, so it's 10, uh, 10 more years of failure and success. Um, uh, you know, most of it happens in, in uh, the last two years, really. Most of the progress has been in the last two years. Um, and have any other labs? Uh, oh, any other labs, yeah. Working? So, so we, we, uh, we provide the instrument uh, and the as a service, and so other labs have done it in that mode. No one has yet purchased the instrument and run it in their own lab, but there, you know, there's a handful of labs that have done their biology with it, mostly to get preliminary results for their grants. You know, that's, it's very early stage. And I think, I, I, quite frankly, I don't think it's that attractive until we get it fully integrated with the expansion microscopy. So I have a follow-up question about the physics of, the yeah. te of a technical nature, because I also found it extremely yeah. fascinating. Yeah. So um, the read lengths and handling of isoforms and things that are really hard and yeah. not yeah. well worked out, yeah. I think, mm -hmm. when you're doing RNA sequencing. Right. So you didn't mention anything about RNA short reads, long reads. Right. Oh, yes. Yeah, all of that yeah. sort of thing. Is it, I assume it's genome-wide, or, or do you have to pick a, a set of transcripts? Yeah, so the way we did it, we used a random priming uh, so that we could get some serendipitous discoveries. Uh, we used both uh, Illumina style sequencing and uh, solid ligation chemistry. Uh, they both work. Uh, the longest read I think we've done is around, is a little over 30 uh, nucleotides, but that's, that's enough to identify an exon or a collection of exons. Um, and so we're not highly motivated to go much longer than that yet anyway. Um, it's kind of a trade-off between how many sections you can do and how many cycles you can do. And I, I guess we're aiming and for... And so I assume you need living cells? These are fixed cells. For, so they're formal and fixed mm -hmm. initially. And then we go through additional uh, steps of uh, building the cDNA and, and, and turn it into a hydrogel. And the same thing goes for expansion microscopy. Uh, in that case, Ed Boyden's group has used antibodies that are labeled with uh, nucleotide, uh, oligonucleotides which are then coupled to the hydrogel, and then when it and then, the, then the deprotonized, when it expands, the nucleic acid tag for the antibody is all that's left. And you essentially got this beautiful, pristine hydrogel with nothing on it other than a few tags. And so that's how you detect proteins uh, okay. for this method, or this cluster of methods. Hi, George. Yeah. So uh, I have two questions. So uh, first question is that um, how long do you think how how long do you think um, it would take for uh, the nanopore sequencing to phase out the current sequencing technology like Illumina and Pike Bio? And second question is that um, is that possible for single molecule sequencing to be um, um, as accurate as Illumina sequencing? I mean, less than one percent accurate, less than one percent uh, error rate, as well as has long read, uh, long read lengths. Okay. Let me let me ask answer the first one the, the second half first because I think it helps you understand this, when it will displace it. Uh, you framed it as a one percent error rate, which is a raw error rate, yeah. um, but most people care about the consensus error rate. 
Uh, the consensus error rate is, uh, goes, gets, improves exponentially. With, in other words, a small number of reads result in a huge improvement in consensus error rate if you're talking about uh, random errors. If you have systematic errors, then typically you change the algorithm so that it accommodates the systematic errors and then you're left with random again. But PacBio is a beautiful example of how you can have very high raw error rates and end up with a beautiful consensus, which in many ways is better than Illumina. So for example, we've been sequencing a bacterial genome for, for many months at thousand-fold coverage uh, in Illumina and could never get fewer than 300 contigs. Um, we did one pack bio run, one contig, and, uh, and it's really high quality. And so what happens is, ironically, even though PacBio has a 50, up to 15% raw error rate, just a, just a stand, kind of standard coverage, 30x coverage, and you're, you're now at 99.99% uh, accurate. And, uh, and so uh, nanopores will, will be a similar, uh, uh, probably, for a while. Although there's the, the, the one nanopore strategy I showed you where it drops the baseline in between, there's no in principle, no reason why you couldn't get a raw error rate that's quite good as well. And then one final comment about the, the, the uh, PacBio is you can get incredible raw error rates on PacBio. So there's some experiments where, it, where you really want to know a particular molecule sequence. You don't want to have a consensus. You want a consensus for that one. So they, the circular mode where they go around and around on the same molecule means that you can get really great raw error rates, which are better than any other uh, uh, clonal amplification or non-amplified method. So I think you, it's really hard to just, many of these were dismissed by some of my colleagues as PacBio, Helicose, Nanopore. They were all ridiculous because they were going to have high error rates. And I say, keep an open mind because, uh, so how quick, quickly will it displace it? A lot of the costs right now for sequencing are equipment amortization. You've got a million dollar piece of equipment, or maybe 10 million in some cases. Uh, that has to go really, really fast uh, in order to uh, justify uh, the capital investment. Uh, because you know, it's highly automated and, and the, the reagent cost drops. And, and so I, I, I think that's one of the advantages of nanopore is you can get something that has, in principle, the same number of read heads per chip but there's nothing really that much more than a chip. Uh, and so you can have an instrument cost in the hundreds of dollars rather than the $10 million. And I think that, again, I'm not, I'm not making hyper promises. I'm just saying keep an open mind. You know, it could, it could be a, a couple of years. We, we, we saw Illumina displaced solid in 454 in, in, in basically one or two years. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so I think this is the last question. Please go ahead. Hi, George. When you talked about the CRISPR system, you said how important it is to start with a good reference genome. Yes. So ideally, well, would you not, say... Not good, but, or but the right, the right reference. one. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So uh, ideally, would you say you need to whole genome every subject before you design a system for them? Uh, that would be nice, yeah. Uh, well, I think everybody should be sequenced anyway, so I'm showing my bias, you know. But uh, assuming everybody's sequenced, it's not an extra burden. But how do you expect to standardize the whole process, right? Standardize? Or is it a custom technique? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, I mean, we're entering the, the, the era of personalized and precision medicine. Mm -hmm. And so we need to, this is just one of many things we need to learn how to standardize mm -hmm. and customize at the same time. You know, you know, cars are pretty safe even though no two cars are alike, right? All right, well, thank you, George. It was really fantastic.